Okay, everyone, welcome back to SFF 180. Uh, this is a, a very uh, short notice uh, live uh, presentation, uh, but uh, I am very pleased uh, to be here with you today, Thomas, your host as always. And I am joined by my good buddy, uh, Marshall Ryan Maresca. You know him as a fantasy author, author of uh, the popular Maradine series, uh, and also a uh, three and God, gotta love neighbors. <laughs> Right when you start, uh, but anyway, <laughs> I'm doing it outside, you know, I always do, but it's, you got to live with it anyway. But you are also, I think, a, you are a three time, right? Three time, yeah. Hugo nominated uh, podcaster, you and your team for world building for masochists, yes. And, um, let me just make sure that the, the chat is up and all of that, make sure that I can see what's going on with everyone. Boom, boom, brand one comments, boom, all right. Okay, so uh, so you you know have a bit of an investment. Hello, Mike, Aura, so it's okay. So some of the regular folks are turning up. So you have um, you know I think a bit of this is going to be some inside baseball discussion. Oh, absolutely, you know, inside baseball. To, this yeah. is this is going to be some pure watch yeah. the sausage get made. Kind yeah, of <laughs> <laughs> but there has been a bit of you know uh, the shenanigans, hasn't there, with at least we suspect something is going on that is not being well explained and it's having to do with the hugo awards which as i'm pretty sure everyone tuning in knows are you know some of the oldest and most prestigious literary science fiction right. fantasy award in the field um i think among the american awards along with the the nebulas they are like you know it's one of the top two and yeah. um <laughs> and it is uh, and of course there there have been other awards that have uh, you know, come uh, come uh, along subsequently and also international awards very prestigious as well like the clarks and and uh, yeah. bsfa and what have you and the aurora in australia and all of that uh but, but they, if there was an egot for the you know science fiction literature awards it would be the oscar <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so <laughs> You know, so we are talking about something that has, you know, that kind of prestige, even though, and we'll talk about this, I think, a little bit later in the live stream, you know, perhaps it's, um, you know, the, the degree to which fans are taking it seriously anymore, you know, is like you say, it's probably on a par with the Oscars now, you know, yeah. uh, I think as, as the generations go on, um, it is, you know, maybe not, you know, the cornerstone of everything. It's just a part of the science fiction community, but... Uh, and now it's only interesting when a big scandal erupts, right? Like nobody cares about the Golden Globes unless a scandal erupts. <laughs> you know? But here we are. Which, luckily, mm -hmm. unlikely for the Hugo, seems to be every other year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is another black eye, but we are uh, saying that this one is the biggest black eye. In fact, I believe that the, oh, absolutely. Uh, the, the editor for, I think, um, gosh, uh, which one was, uh, which uh, is it? The... Uh, you know, again, another uh, Hugo nominated and very prestigious online fanzine has called it probably, you know, the the most embarrassing uh, th thing ever to happen in Hugo history uh, with the awards. So let's talk about what happened. Uh, uh, go ahead and I guess give the give us the, the, the whole setup for all of this, Marshall. All right. So this year's Worldcon and the Hugos are administrated by and presented at each Worldcon, and for Byzantine reasons that I don't know, I don't know if I could adequately explain them, but simply Byzantine reasons dating back to the beginning of Worldcon, no one person or group actually controls Worldcon. It moves from year to year, and each year it is run by the group that ran it, that is, that is running it locally. And so there's, there isn't really a central control or oversight, including they are responsible for running the Hugo Awards, including handling everything with the nominating and voting process. And so this year, for reasons that would be another Byzantine explanation, they were in Chengdu, China. And that created a lot of complications. So normally... It, it, uh, and, I, and it bears mentioning, of course, uh, Cheng, Chengdu ran an, an entirely valid Worldcon campaign. They did. You know, nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but of course, there are concerns, uh, you know, with the, the sort of government that China has and, and the, you know, and, you know, the the rules and the laws there. Um, you know, I think folks have been in the past and, and also in the future concerned about, you know, what if an international, um, you know, Worldcon were to happen in a country that perhaps, you know, does not have the freedoms of the West. There was a lot of concern when Jeddah tried to, uh, in Saudi yeah. Arabia, that, that was, 
I mean, they didn't have a, a, a chance, but still, it was like the fact, you know, there, there, there is, you know, there was even that bid was very concerning. And now, for yeah. God's sake, I think Uganda wants to have it a few years. Uganda has, and and yeah. and I think Tel Aviv is another one that's uh, on the horizon. Yeah, just so just a tiny <laughs> bit controversial. But anyway, but just just is, just a smidge. Yeah, <laughs> a few concerns there. Um, but anyway, you know, please go on. Um. So just to give a, a rundown of the, the typical timetable of the Hugos and World Cana, in a typical year, the nominating period usually stretches from February to mid-March, closes mid-March, and then the announcement of nominees happens in April, and then the World Cana itself is usually August, September-ish, and then and that's where and like the voting for the final winners based on based on who the finalists, not the nominees, I should use the correct language, um, based on who the finalists are, happens like usually June through August, typically. Um, this year, the like the Hugo nomination system just didn't go live until, I think, March. Um, so everything started off behind schedule, closed mid-April, and then for a little inside baseball, the... The finalists are usually notified and thus given the opportunity to decline if they want within a week of the nominations clothing, closing. But this year there was nothing for, for months. I mean, people didn't hear. It closed mid-April. People didn't hear anything until June. And then it was coming out piecemeal. So there was a lot of like whispering behind the scenes of like, I guess the list is all Chinese. I guess that could happen because um, the, none of the usual suspects were hearing things. And then people started hearing things piecemeal. It was like, well, I guess then it's out and we're not nominated. And then five days later, you'd get an email like, oh, okay, I guess we are. Like It was, it was weird. And then once they finally were announced, yeah. then... Things yeah. you know worked on a different time table because their world mm -hmm. and they they bumped it from August to October, right? And so then they did it in October, and and so and, up, to, up to this point, you know, the weirdness again at this, you know, people, you know, it was very easily easy to put it down to well, it's another country and they're trying. It's to another country out. disorganization, yeah. you know, yada yada, yeah. And we're all still, we all still have fresh memories of just what an absolute fuster club New Zealand turned out to be. I mean, they had yeah. a much worse situation going on, but it was still. Organizationally, you know, didn't really have it all together. And, you know, so when the finalist list comes out in July, it's frankly pretty normal looking list. I mean, there are some notable, like a few things that are like, huh, that's surprising it didn't make the list. But nothing, there was no like, and there was a few things like, oh, I guess, you know, there was the biggest surprise was that there was less. Chinese things on there than people thought there might be. I mean, that it was, it looked on the whole pretty typical. Yeah. It still had that kind of Western bias, you know, um, and that has, you know, yeah. always been, and that's traditionally been a criticism of the Hugos. Um, yeah, sure. You know, and in recent years, we are seeing more and more international world cons, but there's always been a criticism of the Hugos that it has reflected kind of an American bias in terms of you know what's popular and what's getting read and 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 i and i saw that very much in fact a lot of people remarked upon how much again talking about new zealand how little that con even you know even with all the difficulties that they had going from a real con to virtual how little they seem to care about their own science fiction writers yeah new you know new zealand has its own science fiction awards that kind of got you know pushed to the you know, kind of a back room and not even really remarked upon. Um, and there was very little interest. And and that's kind of what I like to see. If I want to go, if I'm going to a world con in another country, I want to see more of what is going on with the local scene and local writers. You know, I, I feel yeah. like you know, we got that in uh, to a good degree, I think, maybe not necessarily with the awards, but uh, there was a lot of that representation, for example, in Helsinki, where there were a great many panels. There was a whole lot of programming going on about um you know uh, nordic science fiction nordic horror um and and um and even <laughs> there was a, a very prominent chinese uh, you know science fiction you know that scene educating everyone about that 
Uh, but when it comes down to the awards, yeah, I kind of would like to see more of what is being done internationally, what is being written and published if the if the conference is overseas. And that's always kind of weird when you don't. I mean, if memory serves, um, when it was hosted in, when World Cup was in Japan, I want to say 2006, that sounds right, but I could be wrong. The the Hugo list for that was entirely like English and Anglophone. There wasn't, I don't think there was any significant representation from the home country at all. So, but like, nonetheless, this finalist list didn't seem particularly weird. There were sure some questions like, huh, most notably, huh, Babel didn't make the the nomination the yeah, finalist that, list that was like the big sort of surprising that was, snub that was that like, was the like, surprising snub but not a not a impossible how could it possibly not and the ones that made it like you could see yeah. that you know that's where Hugo voters went and you could you could easily imagine that when the you know, the final data list came out that would have been a close seventh. And yeah. people would be like, yeah, it's a close seventh. It was a close seventh. That happens. Right. Um, <laughs> but a surprise, no. you know, a surprise, kind of disappointing to a lot of people, like the whole Greta, Greta Gerwig thing with the Oscars. Right. You know, but, but still at this point, no real indication of shenanigans. Exactly. And then with the, also with the, you know, when the awards were given out, also no real, I mean, it was an, probably the most impressive looking ceremony if you got a chance to watch it, which actually watching it, you know, online from the U S was a little bit challenging, but if you got a chance to watch it, it was one of the most, no, not one of, it was the most impressive Hugo ceremony ever, ever put on stage. I mean, it, it went all out It had levels of, of, you know, money and, and production value that, no other Hugo ceremony has even come close to. Oh, I'm, I mean, sure, I will... they, I'm sure they were absolutely thrilled to show that off. It's like, yeah, wow. <laughs> it was incredibly impressive. That's, um, yeah, but and then with also with you know who won since there was no real like you know big bombshell surprise in the in the finalists. Also in the winners, the winners seemed. A reasonable normal choice you know nothing nothing controversial happened with that and so people were like okay great now here's where we get to the fun part normally almost right after the ceremony they will release the voting and nomination data yeah yeah I mean, this happens typically ex you know right after I yeah mean, in fact i remember <laughs> when I, I was talking to you in dc uh, yeah, yeah. You know, back in twenty one, like I, we were holding them in our hands. Yeah, we were, in, within an hour of the ceremony, we were sitting there with the packet of papers, just reading. In, in DC, like the ceremony ended, and there were people staged at the doors with packets in hand, handing them out whether you wanted them or not. <laughs> and and these are these are the full stats. These show the yeah. long list. These show how the votes broke down by the numbers. It kind of gives you all of like you know the nerdy details. Yeah. And this year at first, and, and here's an example where communications were just non-existent in the process. <laughs> but um, the you know, people were like, where are the stats? Where are the stats? Where are the stats? And the guy who was the, the chair of the Hugo subcommittee, a guy named Dave McCarthy, a person who personally I was unfamiliar with until these things started happening. Yeah, I didn't know the guy um, existed until days ago, so that's just... <laughs> <laughs> but he was the chair of this committee, and in there were no other communications whatsoever. He pretty much posted on his personal Facebook page something to the kind of like, hey, I'm really exhausted. I'll put them out in the morning. And then in the morning, he was, he was silenced, but it's like, no, today just got away from me because there's so much is going on. And so it'll be probably tomorrow or the next day. And then actually I am so swamped. It probably won't be until I actually get home and sit down at my own desk and recover from jet lag. So Friday at the latest and then Friday comes and goes and still nothing. And then, and to get this information, you had to like dig through the comments to the comments within his Facebook posting. So that, that gives you the idea of the level of, of proper 
you know, organizational communication we're talking about. Yeah, the, the praxis is not, you know, yeah. entirely on the ball here. So finally, somebody pushed him and said, like, look, can you just, you know, if it's going to be late, it's going to be late. Fine. Can you just give us a, a real expected date? Because, you know, it could be anywhere between now and, you know, and by the rules of the of the World Science Fiction Society Constitution, it has to be put out within 90 days, which there, there was a rule that's never been put to the test before because it's usually out within 12 hours. <laughs> but somebody's like, it can be anywhere fine. between now and those 90 days. And so he's yeah. like, fine, it will be at the very end of the 90 days. Yeah, like, you know. <laughs> 90 days and, you know, 11, you know, 23 hours and 59 minutes, practically. Yeah. <laughs> Although, actually, no, I think he, he did kind of like, actually kind of went a little over, didn't he? They, they, he, he, went, he, went, just a bit. he went a day over from when the ceremony was, but not, but the day of for when oh. the, from when the, the last day of the con, last day, last depending, day of the on how, okay. depending on how you interpret that particular rule. But I think his intention was to put it out the day of, but then like didn't get it done until like quarter before midnight and then didn't realize, oh, wait, I have to give this to somebody else for it to go live. So <laughs> so therefore, even even his like snotty, like I did it 45 minutes before, you know, it's still on the day, but mm. then it didn't actually go live. So it's like, he, you know, he has to like, respond to that of like okay well actually mm -hmm. i didn't <laughs> it's like i got yeah, my so part awesome. done and everyone's like what's going on man you know yeah um so but also they released the the voting data and the nomination data separately the voting data came out like mid-december and again nothing too controversial within the voting data um there was a few things where the voting numbers looked a little odd in that a lot of the a lot of the winners won by an atypically large margin nothing not to the point where it's like questionable but, but enough to where you'd notice enough where it's like huh that's statistically uncommon but not like but not shenanigans <laughs> so then when the actual nomination data came out on Saturday, that is a completely different story in terms of shenanigans. Yes. Now that, that is the event. Now this happened again, just last Saturday. So about, yeah. Now. And uh, it completely changed the complexion of all of this. Right. And so, and as we're about to go into this, just to let everyone now know who's watching this, this is now something that has actually been taken up by you know, uh, you know, like the media, right? There's an article written up in the Guardian. It's not just on blogs anymore. You know, so it, it's yeah. turned into kind of a, you know, a notable um, cultural event. So, <laughs> so let's talk about you know uh, the the first problems, the the, the problems that uh, folks immediately noticed. Yeah. So, so the biggest and most obvious problems is was starting first off just in in best novel, where where Rebecca Kwong's Babel or Babel, I don't, whichever you prefer, I don't know what's right. <laughs> um, got should have been on the list, but was simply declared ineligible. Now there are reasons why a finalist could be declared ineligible, despite what the voters wanted. Mm -hmm. Like if, like it really, if if something really came out in 2021 and you put it on the 20 the ballot for stuff that came out in 2022, yeah, that's ineligible. Or there might be some other reason. Or a ton of people put something under novelette that's really a novella or, or, you know, there, there are reasons that the voters could get it wrong and that the administrators need to say, Hey, actually not this, mm -hmm. but, but that's not what happened here. That is not what happened here. Cause almost always when that sort of administrator call is made, it is made citing specifically why yes. and throughout the end, but here it just simply said ineligible. And no throughout the document, even. no explanation whatsoever. And right. throughout the document, there's other things that were declared ineligible where it says exactly why. Like there's, you know, for example, in in dramatic presentation, there's short form and long form. Mm -hmm. So long form is sometimes used for entire seasons of a TV show, mm -hmm. and short form is used for for a single episode. And they there is a rule that you can have something be 
long form for the whole season and one episode in short form. So mm -hmm. something can get disqualified mm -hmm. from one of those two for that. And just to let everyone know, there is what we're talking about here in terms of the rules. There's the World Science Fiction Society. Um, I call it WISFIS because that's easier to say <laughs> than the acronym. But there's the WISFIS Constitution. Right. And um, now this is a, a document that, that is essentially, you know, the rule book, right? right. Uh, but it is a thing that is kind of passed down, you know, from year to year. And so it, it and this constitution does lay out in very specific terms what the criteria are for each category you know what yeah. constitutes a novel novella novelette what constitutes what what is the difference between a, a fanzine and a semi prozine you know a fan cast or fans you know those sorts of things right. what makes somebody a, a, a fan artist versus a professional artist it all has to do with you know are, are you being paid how much etc what uh, so there are very specific rules however and this is <laughs> i think you know what is considered the problem and it's from year to year which is that there's never, you know, it, it does end up being, despite this constitution, every World Con is, uh, and every Hugo uh, committee ends up sort of reinventing the wheel because there's never kind of a consistent, you know, uh, year to year kind of, you know, set of <laughs> precedents, right? In terms right. of here's sort of how, you know, there's there's not been that kind of ongoing shall we say, I don't know, supervision or just that guiding, you know, the, just the guidance. Um, you know, every every Worldcon just kind of has to do their thing, right? And, but there is something kind of fascinating that it is yeah. like, it, it's it got to reinvent the wheel because it's a different group every time, but yet yeah. the same old people seem to be involved in doing it year yeah. after year. <laughs> yeah, but, so, but you would think that, that would lead to a little bit more. Consistent. You would think that would, yeah, you would, but yet uh, somehow no. no. Yeah. But, <laughs> But anyway, so there is this constitution that is laying all these things out. And so, um, and this is now the document that is being referred to by Dave McCarty um, when he is now attempting to answer questions or shall we say <laughs> doing his very best. Not Avoid questions. <laughs> yeah, this is the, the very strange thing because a lot of folks are now asking him, okay, it was one thing when everyone thought that uh, Babel was just this unfortunate snub, right? Yeah. Um, but now that you see that in the final voting tally, it would have been the third place pick, you know, but there is the asterisk next to it. And they're saying, no, we pulled this one it is declared ineligible uh, and no explanation given. It is reasonable for people to want to know why, particularly since a again, you look at the Constitution, you look at the definition of novel, you look at the criteria for release dates and what have you. You're right. Okay, Babel was a Babel was a number one New York Times bestselling novel. It won the Nebula Award. It won the Locus Award. Does not appear to be anything, at least in terms of what it is, that would disqualify it for best novel in the Hugo. So now we really, you know, we, we should have an explanation. And Especially since have, throughout the document, various mm -hmm. ineligibilities are explained. Yeah. The fact that there are a handful that are left unexplained makes them even like even more questionable like if they had mm -hmm. all just been marked ineligible with no explanation and people just had to like then yeah. at least it wouldn't seem inconsistent it would seem like oh they just didn't know how to format yeah, the document it would, properly <laughs> yeah, it's almost as if just being able to put this down to total incompetence would have been a better thing but because there is this lack of surety uh, and and this confusion and and these discrepancies, um, yeah. the, the inconsistencies, and you have Dave McCarty who is on his Facebook page, uh, becoming more and more aggressive, more and more defensive when folks are trying to bring this up, um, almost to the point. Well, not almost. I think he's kind of now gotten to to the point where he's acting like a Reddit troll, calling people names, being really angry with folks, and they're just trying he to. He did that at first, and now he's just yeah. going completely silent. Yeah, well, now, right. I mean, <laughs> except, of course, when Neil Gaiman popped up in his comment thread. Right. And then he was super deferential to Mr. Gaiman, of course. But uh, still, there was this weird situation in which, okay, Sandman the series was a. Uh, Sandman the series was, was DQ'd from long form dramatic because the individual episode, the uh, episode six, was in the short form. So right. they pulled it from um, the. Uh, from the the long form category but then episode six was pulled was rendered ineligible in short form without explanation and uh and of course, all dave mccarty was saying back when he was just being rude to people was 
Well, we looked at the Constitution and made our choice. We looked at the rules and made our choice. We looked at the Constitution and the rules we must follow. That was always yeah, the, the rules we must follow. Which and, people were like, and which rules are these, Dave? Yeah, which rules because, are these? You know, we're, we're all reading the them ourselves. The rules we must follow in the room with us now. Yeah, <laughs> and by the way, uh, those of you watching at home, uh, down you know, on YouTube, down below where the links live, I've got the links to, uh, I, I do have a link to uh, the, the, all those voting stats all that, that paperwork, right. that whole, that, that entire PDF file, you can check it out. Um, so anyway, uh, let's go on. So other, other weird snubs we had were, um, Paul uh, Weimer for fan writer, writer, my good buddy, and, Paul, and, uh, and Sharon J. 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 for, for, for the astounding, uh -huh. there were a couple of others, um, Chinese works that also had that sort of mystery thing. And I think at least from what I've heard, Mm -hmm. Some of those might have just been like issues in terms of like, well, the translation came out in in 2021 or something like that. Some I don't know the details of those, but I've mm -hmm. heard that at least some of those have a reasonable explanation that. Yeah, that you people figured out. Yeah, it's even like, if you know, the locally <laughs> produced work, you know, it might have just some more explanation but I, I won't say for certain that those weren't also the yeah. same kind of just random snubs for the same random okay. reason so um, now because <laughs> because we are are dealing with this lack of explanation uh we have a dude who is you know again the administrator acting the way he's acting uh in a baffling way i mean there seems to be no logical reason for him to to be getting defensive and aggro with people who just want reasonable answers to things uh, so now what's what's happening of course now conspiracy th theories for several days have now been flying or show or at least just speculation we're all we're, people now because this is the internet if you have to fall back on speculation you're going to do it and now the two most popular uh, i think you know theories seem to be okay a they're all just idiots and realized too late that they were idiots and messed up the counts or this or that and now they're just playing cya and they just can't fess up and and take accountability that's three a and then theory B, of course, is that there is like, you know, nefarious, you know, shadowy figures from the Chinese government are, you know, I guess, pulling people into dark rooms and threatening them with whatever if, you know, certain undesirables aren't removed from the list or what have you. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm being very dramatic about it, but that, that's actually not an improbable or impossible thing in an authoritarian country that exercises extremely strict censorship on the arts and the media. Right. So, right. And I mean. I mean, some people are going like, oh, you're all being hyperbolic. And I'm I'm sure it was not so direct as that, that, you know, you know, somebody first presented their proto finalist list to a government official who then was like, Paul Weimer. No, we can't have Paul. Like, I doubt that specifically <laughs> happened that like, <laughs> that, you know, somebody in the net. Oh, I've lost your sound. I did not hit the button. There we are. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so I mean, speculation has all, has run to the idea, of course, that you know, uh, which of course in a vacuum, speculation will run wild. Right. So, like you that. know, Rebecca Kwan, they look at her novels. Her novels are, you know, all about you know anti-imperialism, authoritarianism. You know, that you take that very strong political stance. Um, Sharon J. Shao also, you know, has been extremely, you know, has has critical of that. There's also, you know, people were thinking, I think. No, I think we're back to Rebecca Quang now. I think her, someone in her family was a, a supporter of Chiang Kai-shek, you know, so they're speculating about that, that it's retaliation for this and that, or that, uh, or, or that I think her father, I believe, Rebecca's her father, father was, was, was a protester in Tiananmen at Square. At Tiananmen Square, Square right? So, you know, they're wondering if, you know, they're looking back at the family connection. There, there, there is all sorts of wild speculation. Uh, why, yeah, I mean. Why, say, a government official might choose, them, like, but then why Paul? What you know? What has Paul done? No, <laughs> you know, but yeah, Paul is just like you know, just this sweet guy who just writes Spanish stuff. You know, yeah. Um, he, I, think, um, I think he said at some point that he may have like signed some online. I, I could be wrong, but he, he may. I think he might have said that he might have signed some online petition protesting the treatment of the Uyghur Muslims or something in China. Right. You know, right when when COVID was you know coming out and all of that. So you know, so. Uh, but that, I've seen a lot of theories, and then I've be, seen you know. people say like, "Well, you know." But I've I've seen some of the finalists be like, "Well, that would have applied to me too if that had happened." And I think at best, if that sort of if some sort of like governmental type implicit or explicit 
censorship occurred. It did not occur in any sort of like necessarily logical or, I mean, I think no matter what, when you look at all the problems that we have here, because there's more than just the ineligibility as problems here. If you, we kind of have to look for like glass onion solutions. If you remember the movie glass onion where he, you know, dismisses what the most obvious thing is first, because he couldn't believe that, that this billionaire could be that stupid, but no, <laughs> so, so it, it does have this sort of like, oh, it's so dumb, it's brilliant. No, yeah, it's just <laughs> dumb. <laughs> like, they can't I possibly think, be that stupid. Turns out to never. Yeah, I think we need to embrace because, I mean, I have racked my brain trying to think of plausible scenarios, and there's none really tie or a unified plausible scenario because so many of the problems are working cross purposes and. So it's got to be simply like th there's a level of like no one could be that dumb. Yes, they could. <laughs> and on that sort of level of they also have to presume that the people who are going to look at this data would also have been dumb and not notice or care, which like when we get to like, you know, Dave being belligerent on his Facebook and, you know, Mm -hmm. I, I, I definitely see that as like, he wasn't doing like official comms work as the, as the chair of the Hugo subcommittee. He was, I'm yelling at people on my Facebook page who are giving me or bugging me about a thing and, it was, you know, certainly <laughs> and not, not thinking of it as like, as being a public facing thing. Yeah. yeah certainly questions. not covering himself in glory with that. You know, yeah. <laughs> and again, just to, uh, again, to explain once again to, uh, you know, Avronator and other folks. He, uh, the Worldcon last year uh, did take place in Chengdu, China. You know, because every year Worldcon uh, gets bid on by a different city, and um, you know, and often outside the country, and uh, and it is voted on the location for us. You know, each Worldcon each year is is they run a campaign, and uh, the fans, Worldcon fans, will vote on their city of choice. Usually about two to three years in advance, I think. Two years. Two years. Two years in advance. And um, yes, Aldor, you're right. Typical Facebook behavior. But, um, you know, uh, Chengdu uh, won the bid for 2023. Now, there's also, you know, a lot of folks believe that they won the bid because a couple of other bids that would have been more likely winners. Uh, I think Memphis, Tennessee was one, but I think they're, they're con con Memphis. Memphis is con con fall apart, so they were basically off. And then yeah, and then Nice Winnipeg was a late addition because and, Nice had to drop out. Nice in France right. had to drop out for whatever thing. And then so. Winnipeg was a late addition. Mm -hmm. Like it literally did come in after the deadline when you're, and yeah. they basically didn't run much of a campaign beyond hey we're not in China. <laughs> no, that, yeah, that's pretty much all their all their whole campaign was. And, and then, uh, speaking of not covering yourself in glory, I think you know they actually did kind of try to pull a Trump thing at the twenty one uh, Worldcon when Chengdu won the thing, and then the Winnipeg guys came out and were like, "Oh, look, you know, looks uh, I bet all, this was ballot stuffing. Look, the you know, looks yeah. as there's not addresses properly filled out on these forms." It's like, well, yeah, of course, well, you know, people who live in China don't necessarily have. You know, they, they're, their residence status, you know, home addresses like we have in the West, you know, aren't kind of done. This, you know, it's not the same kind of thing, you know, here. So, you know, you would not necessarily get a form filled out, uh, you know, from Chinese fans the way you would from. Isn't that like having a gay pregnant? Um, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> I don't know that I would go that far, but uh, I would definitely not go that far. Yeah, I mean, no, I don't, it's, uh, in all of this, I do not want to diminish that there yeah. are a lot of major science fiction and fantasy fans in China who yeah. very much deserve to have their, you know, to have their convention and to, to celebrate their love for the genre. Which, yeah, they do. If I you saw any footage from this world yeah. con, was definitely what was happening. I mean, there was, yeah. I mean, the footage of what we saw there was gorgeous. And, you know, mm -hmm. they, in running the con itself, they really did an amazing job. I want to make yeah. that very yeah. clear. <laughs> and, and it is true, as you bring up, you know, yes, China has a huge science fiction fandom scene. Uh, science Fiction World, I believe, is their monthly short fiction magazine, which has the highest circulation of any science fiction magazine in the world because of just the vast population there. Um, uh, Three Body Problem has sold how many? A couple million copies? Yeah, you know, something like that. So it, it would be a huge bestseller by like, you know, like it's a Stephen King level bestseller over there, right? 
and mm -hmm. international and then the the us and of course now it's going to be on netflix and it's going to be you know, even bigger globally so this is all indicative of a very big fandom yes mm -hmm. there is strict uh, censorship and it is not a freedom of speech country uh, like we have here but at the same time they do have that that subculture and as as marshall points out yeah sure they deserve to have a con they deserve to be able to you know be represented in phantom as well now in terms of the um the human rights situation yeah now this is this is a situation where people do the kind of team nature of yeah the, of and, the, and you kind of have to vote with your votes in this one you know for example yeah. if, if a country has like a really god-awful human rights records I mean, this is, of course, why absolutely nobody. I mean, when Jetta announced uh, their uh, their bid for 2022, you know, Chicago eventually won, but you know, there was. I mean, nobody, you know, was gonna. I mean, was gonna look at that and be like, oh yeah, sure, uh huh, we'll go to we'll go to that. You know, um, any place where you know, like, you know, set foot outside the hotel without a you know head covering and you know get arrested yeah. or something. You know, you don't want to go. And this is the same now thing, the same conversation happening with everybody just being aghast that Uganda, um, and the, you know, the capital city, putting together a bid, putting together a bid for like what twenty seven or something. Twenty seven. Yeah, twenty seven. Don't think they're going to win, but it, yes, it is kind of ballsy that they would even do it. And, you know, sure, it would be nice to see kind of a, you know, an African. Um, uh, and again, well, this not, is not there, you know, not where <laughs> it's like, you know, it's a death sentence to be queer. Right. So, you know, uh, but so, again, so, I, like, I feel like yeah. we, we absolutely have to differentiate between these fan yeah. groups that, you know, it weren't exist in Saudi Arabia, exist in Uganda, sure. who want to do their, you know, celebrate globally as well. Yeah. And the regardless of how screwed up their governments are and that the these fan groups are not their governments and, and yeah. i think that's a crucial thing to to, to bear in mind but yeah, also and a lot of them are probably you know not <laughs> not having their best lives under the kinds yeah. of governments that they have to live under too i mean that's yeah. the thing, you know like a in very oppressive uh i mean we live in texas so we have a, a yes. version of that <laughs> yes. so, pregnant women having to sleep. nowhere near as bad but um, still <laughs> oh i'm gonna have a stillbirth so i have to sneak out of the state you know yes yeah. uh, boy but that's a whole other conversation let's not get down that's that rabbit hole totally yeah, it, it, it's it, it, so it's a it's a thing where yeah the fan groups you do have to differentiate um and but at the same time yes you it's entirely understandable why folks you know from around the world just wouldn't want to, you know, where you enjoy certain freedoms, would not want to go to a country where they would be in any way, shape, or form in danger. And this, of course, was a concern with Chengdu, with China. Yeah. Uh, Jeanette Ng, who, you know, won and delivered that legendary uh, speech in um, in Dublin that, you know, I think we I saw live, I think you were there. Um, I wasn't there. No, okay, well, I yeah, do. we have to solve that. <laughs> but I do remember it. <laughs> yeah, and that actually got the name of a, the name of a major award changed, right? Right. But she said, but, uh, but you know, she said my speech would have gotten me arrested in China. You know, that specific speech. So there is a concern, and this is why a lot of um, professionals so, and fans from the West didn't go to Chengdu. This was why there were a handful of Western authors and creators who um, declined their human nomination. Yeah. Um, SP Divya declined is the big one I can think of. Uh, there, there were some others too, but, but, so if we're gonna if we're gonna put on our tinfoil hats for uh, yes, for, yeah. So getting back to the whole <laughs> the Hugo's, we wanted yeah. So let's discuss again in, a, in addition to what the probable cause would have been for this, uh, why all of this would have happened, and then you know we'll, we'll we will segue into so why is this being considered the size you know the the magnitude of scandal that it is for the awards and uh, perhaps even, uh, you know, a risk to the uh, integrity of the awards going into the future. You know, why is this as big as it is in, in comparison to other instances where the Hugos have had serious egg on their face? Sure. And for part of this, I do want to stress that there are significant problems with the nomination data beyond just these random, these unexplicable ineligibilities. Um, simply put, the math does not work. It is deeply, I mean, I, I started, you know, started digging into it and then dug more and more. And the more that I dug, the weirder and weirder it got. And I'm not going to go full Steve Kornacki and, and, <laughs> and, and bore your, your viewers with, with a lot of details of how the math doesn't work, but because you have to understand how the voting math works in the first place, which is this complicated procedure called uh, E Pluribus Hugo or EPH, which 
generates different numbers that then get compared and it's it is complex yeah and 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 that and that was a new uh policy that was inst instituted in wake of the uh the whole sad puppies affair about right. like nine or ten years ago to prevent people from basically trolling the awards with you know bad faith nominations and slates of things to it's try to mostly yeah. it's mostly there to reduce the impact of slated votes in that it creates a situation where a bunch of identical ballots will have less power than somebody just voting for one thing. Because when you nominate, you can nominate five things on your ballot. So every, every one of the finalists and things on the long list that they put out. In each category, um, you can pick up. In each five. category, you get the full list of, of the finalists and how many, how many, raw ballots they got and then all of their EPH data plus like the next nine of the long list and how many ballots they got and how and how that got how that got uh figured out so you can see all the EPH data for for the finalists and the the nine before that yeah and to, kind of, and to cut to the chase sort of on all of this what you have are columns of numbers yeah where the numbers are uh recording that there were these are higher numbers than the actual votes that were cast. They are, there's huge discrepancies. Yeah. So, you know, there are more, you know, there's a total number of votes in a, in a particular category, but then you look in a certain column and you're like, well, wait, that's a much bigger number. So how is right. this happening? So, so the math is not mathing. The math is not mathing, especially you have a situation where, and this is where we it, think shenanigans have come into play. And shenanigans. Not in let me make something clear. Shenanigans definitely occurred. And these numbers have been tampered with. I don't know who, I don't know what their motivation was or at what stage it occurred, but it definitely happened because these, you know, these numbers do not make sense. And what it looks like to me, this is my theory based on what we're seeing, because we're seeing in almost every category, the, the finalists have this as a group have this massively higher number of of nominations than the rest below them and also massively higher than anything historically for to give an example in best series which is a relatively new um category all six of the finalists got between 801 and 956 uh nominations like all, all of them. And then the, the seventh one, the first one off the long of the top of the long list, got 52. Okay. And so that is a huge <laughs> gap. When that is a you, huge gap. And what you would expect to see in a normal Hugo year would be a much more, you know, um, graduated, graduated drop. drop that would look, you know, that would make sense, right? And especially not since to, in the history of the award, the fall off a cliff all at once. Doesn't make In sense. the history of the award, the most nominations any series has ever gotten was the Vorkosian saga the first year the award came came out which got 350 and the Vorkosian saga if you know like how Hugo voters what that's one of all like Hugo voters in general one of their favorite series ever yeah <laughs> and, i mean it's like what have four what four three or four of the novels in that series individually have won best novel hugo right, right? or at least were nominated it is something um, like that i mean i know i know Bujold has four hugo wins uh, so probably uh, even more yeah. were nominated. But the point is, yeah. that is a, a massively beloved series to the typical Hugo voter. And it got 300 and 342, I think. It, and this year, six series got over 800. I mean, yeah, that's or, just not, not... To also look at it, um, Rivers of London was one of the finalists this year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I, I mean, yeah. absolutely no disrespect to Ben Average when I'm saying that, but in... It had been on the long list in 21 and 22. In 21, it got like 67 votes. In 22, it got like 37 votes. And then this year, it got 950. Like, wow. <laughs> kind of sus. That, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, yeah. That just, now, those, I mean, those are the sort of things where, like, mm -hmm. if you, and the same thing with the EPH numbers, like, mm -hmm. the EPH number represents a percent portion of the ballot since five things can be on the ballot so if you took mm -hmm. the ratio to total number of of nominations and divided that by the eph number you would get a number between one and five mm -hmm. it cannot be higher than five 
Okay. If you take the EPH number of Babel for you know Rebecca Kwan's book and divide it by the number of ballots, you get 4.91, which <laughs> Mm, yeah, which okay. to explain means that almost every single ballot it was on would have had to have also voted for every single thing that was a finalist hmm. and almost and almost i mean hmm. and again wow. in best in best novels another case where you have like everything is the the number of, of ballots is between you know 700 and 800 and then the next one down is 150. Right. So my putting on my tinfoil hat for a minute, my theory here, and the EPH numbers also don't, because they do not add up correctly. My theory here is somebody, because one of two things had to have happened. Either there was a massive quiet slate campaign that, that managed to put in hundreds of extra nominees for what ended up being the finalists with no word getting out that also had the foresight to in best novel go we should add one more to this list just in case something gets disqualified because the top six is the things that you know have the bulked up numbers except in best novel where something got disqualified and it's the top seven mm -hmm. like <laughs> It's a lit. It's <laughs> like that doesn't pass the plausibility test. Mm. Or okay. somebody mm. once having the finalist list wanted to make it look like more people nominated than they did, and figured it was harmless to just add numbers to the things that were finalists, and then try and tweak the EPH numbers to match that, and did a terrible job of that. <laughs> um, and because if you just raise the numbers that the finalists got, then you're not changing the results. You're just making it look like more people voted, mm -hmm. which. Yeah. And, 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 and so <laughs> this, I think would be this lack of real clarity in terms of how these numbers are not added, right. and, and not adding up as badly as they're not adding up. I'm going to say this is why this is why everyone is saying this is probably going to be the biggest scandal ever to hit. Human. Right. Far more than cultural differences with China, far more than, oh, you know, somebody goofed or, you know, or far more than just any kind of, you know, oh, well, I missed a, a deadline. Sorry. Or what have you, you know, beyond incompetence and beyond any kind of, you know, political arm twisting, just the very idea that behind the scenes, you know, just uh, the, the, you know, the votes. The Hugo voters' choices, which ought to be sacrosanct, because you know you're you're be exercising your rights as a Worldcon member under the Wisfis Constitution to vote and have your vote counted. If this is all being you know futzed with behind the scenes, then that is scandalous. In the same way yeah. that it would be for like you know any kind of local or state you know political election or anything else. The the most absurd thing about this is if you were going to mess with the numbers anyway and knew that this thing of like just declaring Babel ineligible would have raised flags why not why not mess with the numbers to hide the fact that you did that like that's the part yeah. that boggles my mind <laughs> <It's> like because <laughs> you're where they can't possibly be that stupid you know that are working cross purposes <laughs> that, like, here's here is evidence of you know that you tampered but the thing that you probably should have wanted to hide if you were tampering things, you left in the open. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Just like, you know, you break into a jewelry store with no gloves, basically. You know, it's like, <laughs> just, and then leave a soda can behind with your DNA on it. It's just sort of like, and yeah, we, you did the deeds, you did it so. It's sort of like burning down the house to hide the fact you crashed the car. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's like, no, now you have a crash car and a burned down house. <laughs> so, so, there, so there is a lot of not very smart going on here. There's, but, there's, you know. there's a lot of not smart going on right there. And then you have the fact that they still put this document out like, like yeah. your target like, audience for the, the people who would look at it like they weren't weird nerds who aren't going to pour through this and break it down. Yeah, because that's so, what weird nerds do. Weird nerds yeah. and pour through things, break it down. They're good at math especially science fiction people. That's the bad right. thing. They just kind of, all right, we put it out and thought that it would just not, uh, not really be looked at. I mean, that's the only thing I can think of is you're going to put out this terrible document. Like I clearly, 
that seems to be the clear motivation for why why delay 90 days like that maybe you could slip it out and you know you're three months from when the awards were given surely nobody's going to care okay like have you met fandom but then i think also he thought yes fandom's going to to, to make a little uh, noise it'll 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 be a thing for a couple days and and then oh it'll just you know yeah. be a you know, buried in the back of, of yeah. the fan encyclopedia again, and we'll move on. Mm -hmm. And I think, mm -hmm. I think they didn't realize just how big this was going to get. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. And I think that is probably, you know, it could be why maybe just a, you know, slightly why Dave McCarty is just getting so flustered about all of this, you know, a lot is suddenly now coming down on his head in a way that I don't think he probably expected it to. Now, yeah, I, we're, now and, and by the way, we should point out, we're not like specifically accusing Dave McCarty of any kind. He's of, the only person who has chosen to make himself a public face about this. Yeah, yeah. Um, he, we're talking about him, yeah, just because he's put himself out there and he's, uh, you know, acted the way he's acting. And so, you know, in that regard, uh, he's he's kind of fair game. We don't know. to. There, to, there was a whole Hugo subcommittee yeah. that had nine people, including Ben Yallo, who right. was the, the co-chair of the whole thing. Yeah, and veteran dude, like I've known him since, you know, the 80s, late 80s, early 90s, you know, so he's been at the whole, you know, Seeker Masters of Fandom thing for most of his life, you know. Yeah, so, you know, like, like with this stuff, and, yeah, with this stuff and all the, all the strange decisions and bad math, they still and taking 90 days in which if your intention was to doctor it, then why didn't you doctor <laughs> like like I'm thinking like a writer, like if you're gonna write a villain, like if you're going to do shenanigans, do shenanigans that you know make it look that make it look plausible. I and mean, people are like, oh, it's to be so hard to fake EPH data. Let me tell you, if I had 90 days in the spreadsheet, I could make something that looked plausible that nobody would would find these errors in. But you know, and it, the irony is at the beginning of this, when people are like, so how long is it gonna take? It's like, well, we really have to make sure, like this is an actual quote. I'm gonna well paraphrase but he's like which would be worse to put it out now and have a bunch of mistakes people would catch or take the time to get it right people are like okay fine take the time to get it right but he took the time and still this is what they put out <laughs> which again like like it, it really boggles the mind of like what were you thinking if you thought this was going to you know gonna fly yeah I mean, <laughs> uh, well, you know, life I've you know, often thought is, you know, it's it's a novel that would be rejected by an editor just because of just yeah. logic flaws. Um, you know, uh, so, so we, you know, so a lot of people, as we've talked about in, uh, in the community online, uh, tons of people now have sounded off, you know, about this, you know, uh, you know well-known writers, you know, bloggers like uh, Comestros, uh, Flapton, uh, John Scalzi, Aidan Mower talking about so you know a lot of folks are talking about this and now of course everyone's been interviewed for the guardian and <laughs> um let's see uh let's uh t -t 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 -t. i just noticed earlier because i uh, uh Cora Bullard also um well-known fan writer and blogger who was talking yeah, about this. she wrote right. a, a wonderful write-up of everything that that really breaks down all the things and very very detailed and in, in fact very what detailed I'll, she did great work. I'm, yeah in fact what i'm gonna that's do probably is, the best primer out there of all yeah. the details i will uh, add this link well, i bet i could uh, you know toss it into into the chat here but i'll also add it to the description but she has mentioned now because she's adding more and more to her uh you know uh, article as, as developments happen uh but we now have it's uh, people are already taking kind of steps with this because you know again now the worry that uh, how is this going to um affect uh, you know affect uh, <laughs> as old yeah how is this going to affect uh, you know just the uh, the uh, the trust in the awards going into the future because this is already an, an award that has uh, you know been <laughs> been tried and tested and has had serious trust issues uh even even having things not to do with the awards themselves like who in the hell got said it would be a good idea in 2021 hey let's get raytheon to sponsor the hugo awards that'll go over like gangbusters but anyway you know what? as much of a scandal that was you know what raytheon you know raytheon didn't you know step in and say hey let's remove some nominees <laughs> no i mean at least i didn't do that it's like uh, well, you know, uh, missiles are expensive and they kind of, you know, you talk about remove nominees. No, I don't think we'll, you know, we're not going to do that. No, I don't mean remove them that way. But okay, <laughs> anyway. anyway, so Cheryl Morgan, 
uh, is another blog. I'm just reading through this. I'm going to put all these links. I'm going to add them to, like I said, description and what have you. But there are apparently now like our kind of ideas being put forth uh, to to figure out how in some way, and this would even involve decoupling um, you know, the Hugo Award administration from the host world con. So now it's right. not like the same, you know, so that there probably is what has been, you know, th this lack of consistency. Um, I can always count on George for the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, you know, this I mean, lack so many of the problems come from the fact that the yeah. World Science Fiction Society's rules are deeply Byzantine and require two years to change, and you have a bunch of you know, long-standing people whose entire mindset is, and therefore we should never change them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and it is it is also an a, an older guard of fandom getting it as well. Yeah. And you can get older, right? You know, just you know, us old guys, right? We get set in our ways, don't we, Marshall? We never want to get off the recliner and do anything, do we? <laughs> you know? um, no, it's it, it's it is though that that uh, a factor again. This is a, another thing that has been a great deal of concern that you know whether or not Worldcon culture itself will continue to have much relevance, uh, in, yeah. in, uh, in the future decades, uh, you know, the years and, um, in 22, um, uh, I have, you know, a little group of my, my book to, you know, friends, you know, we were sort of regular Worldcon attendees, but there are some other folks in kind of, you know, book SFF, like, you know, millennial folks and younger never really been to it because we're now kind of into a generation, you know, a couple generations now where, you know, there's been the internet, right? So your entry, ramp into fandom hasn't had to be convention culture, right? Right. You know, so you now have social media and, and also there's, there's booktube, book talk, bookstagram, this, that, and the other. And, and of course, book blogs starting with that. Uh, so what happens is, you know, I have, so I have some booktuber friends who, you know, like in their early thirties who went to their very first Worldcon in Chicago. First comment, every single one of them made after the conference was, my God, everyone is so old, right? <laughs> Very graying convention, right? And, and and that is, and that was And even that deeper so if you go into like the business mirrors of where these, yeah. where these decisions are made, like you and I would be been doing the it young, we would be the young guys in that yeah. room. We <laughs> We're in our fifties. <laughs> And so there, and so the the graying of this kind of you know this this area of fandom, you know, it's like and and without much being done to I think draw in and attract, um, you know, younger generations of readers is is right. leading to because this was something in fact years ago when uh, Worldcon was in San Antonio. I, I was living in Austin at the time still, so hour drive for me, and I didn't go. That was kind of how not into it I was at the time, but. Um, they were talking about that then, right? This was, yeah, about, you know, an older fandom, um, you know, uh, you know, guys, you know, dealers in the dealers' room selling, you know, collectors' books to, you know, people who are, you know, now who are reading books on their mm -hmm. iPads and phones, and it's a kind of sort of, it's, so it's a whole different kind of cultural um, outlook, and you know, so, so in addition to the fact that it's quite possible Worldcon and even the Hugos are becoming less and less important. And will continue to do so. Now there is this lack of trust over. Well, you know, we should be able to trust that our votes will be counted. But if they're just people behind the yeah. scenes going, well, you know, no, I'm going to, I think I'll tweak this and fiddle with that, and you know, do yeah. this, and uh, then why even, you know, why bother, right? You know, and 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 for fan awards now, there's also God help us, and Goodreads awards. That you don't have to pay a fifty dollar convention membership to take part in, um, yeah. and they get a lot more participation. So yes, so in addition, can this now this thing that has kind of uh, eroded trust in the voting process is this just going to be another knock? Is this going to be something that the Hugos can recover from and like have a future in, or you know, is it eventually going to just uh, trickle away and become a relic of science fiction fandom past? That's a good question. I certainly mm. hope it can. I certainly hope that. Certainly, this creates a call to action, and at least it seems like some of the people who would be the sort of people who should make the call to action, make it happen, uh, that they <laughs> that they are paying attention. Like, oh, we can't just keep running this like we have all all this time because so much of the process is run on just sort of like, well, there's no real mechanism to control this, but we just trust that Dave's got it, and you know. <laughs> Clearly, Dave yeah. does not have it. But I also yeah, want to point uh, out that let's, there's, let's, uh, let's, uh, there's a lot of difference between <laughs> like attending Worldcon and going to the Hugos and all that. That 
is not about this, you know, the weird Byzantine stuff of like going to going to the business meeting and all that. Like you can like there there is definitely like yes, there is a very much a graying of the fandom, but there is still at least you know the parts where I hung out, there is still mm -hmm. something, you know, more vibrant and alive in, the, in that part of it. But mm -hmm. it is I think that there is a very different experience between going to just enjoy and share with other science fiction and fantasy fans mm -hmm. and going into the sausage factory. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Which is <laughs> and most people don't care about the sausage factory. Mm -hmm. And most and most people who have you know paid attention to the Hugo Awards in terms of just what the winners and finalists are, never paid attention to again the, how the sausage is made. And I don't, I don't know, they shouldn't even have to. But since I love how we can just know, use the food <laughs> metaphor, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and and of course now, and and you have now you know another very popular uh, convention that is well vastly more popular than Morcon ever is with Dragon Con, you know, which has already started catering to been more open to other areas of fandom, but also now has, has their literary yeah. back. And so now with the Dragon Awards, and I don't know to, to what degree the Dragon Awards, you know, the participation of there, there is one, th there's one thing. And I think in one thing only that, um, that uh, the Hugo's has in its corner that it can, you know, say, well, here's what we got. Right. And that is of course, it's longevity and the prestige that just kind of comes with the longevity. Um, and uh, now that doesn't mean it's always going to hang on to that, but you can at least right. look at it and say that, you know, there was a time when, um, you know, it was, you could look at it as, you know, this is kind of how fandom got together and sort of had this consensus about what was representing excellence in the field in that given year. And you can look at the past, years of the award and and look at books that were winners that have now gone on to become all-time classics and what have you. And so you say, so it is, so it is, you know, the, the history of science fiction and Hugo's are kind of this thing that walk hand in hand. Um, that doesn't guarantee that it will remain relevant in the future, but you know, you can, in terms of what it still has, the Hugo's still have to kind of say, well, here's, <laughs> here's what we've got. <laughs> You know, is a you know a new award can come along and be very popular and get a lot of participation. Will that necessarily translate immediately to prestige? I don't necessarily. I, I don't think so. Always. I mean, it can eventually, uh, but I do think um, your popularity. Yeah, I mean, just... <laughs> popularity can come quickly, but prestige, I do think, still you know yeah. kind of has to be an earned thing. Um, it's just it's sort of like when um, you know, for example, in the sci in the arts as well as in the sciences, you know, there's a Nobel Prize, right? And yeah. uh, and so that, of course, highly prestigious, right? About as prestigious as you get. Um, there was a group um, in the like hard right evangelical uh, wing of uh, fundamentalist Christianity called the Templeton Foundation. And the Templeton Foundation, um, their agenda is to to make it appear as if there is a movement within science to validate, you know, conservative mm -hmm. religious beliefs right and so to and and as part of that what they did was they put together their own templeton uh grant or prize their templeton prize and they deliberately made it more money than the nobels right i think the <laughs> nobels are like a million something or a million dollars even or something and the templeton went a bit or the equivalent in in swedish yeah. and so it is there there is this idea that well you know we don't like you for whatever reason so but, but what well, we can do this you know <laughs> we'll have our own award with, you know, hookers and blow and you know, more money and <laughs> that kind of thing. But I do. So, yes, you can you can get popular, but does popularity automatically equal the prestige? Not necessarily. So well, I think what the Hugos are going to have to do and it's going to be an uphill climb for them is really figure out a way to get, you know, folks who are like, you know, um, you know, like uh, Aldora right here um, to feel like, you know, well, yes, this this is for you and this can be for you and we can make this for you. But it's going to be a tough sell, isn't it? I mean, I think some yeah. there's gonna be some sea changes are going to need to to happen. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, what what are your what are some of your thoughts on that? Because I mean, I, I definitely think because it is still the you know most known prestige award. Like it's it's the award that people who are not part of you know fandom are aware exists. And so I think that prestige and I think the recovery can happen, but it can only happen if 
people are willing to do the work and people who are holding on to whatever power they have over this sort of process let go a little and let it let it recover and do that sort of work to 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 let it be get back to prestige and, and i think that that is tied to letting it having it be a uh you know having it be operated by something a little more independent and of the con itself like the con can still every con can still run the ceremony but have the process of voting and and you know distributing the nominees and all that that that's <laughs> that that you know is handled by a central party that just handles it every year and that could be done except people choose not to and then complain that they're that they're volunteer work <laughs> that they yeah, I mean, that they had to do the volunteer work to do it instead of you know it, it's weird that you know yeah we have you know i think as as uh, texas pelican here points out you know i think we have this uh there is kind of a love-hate relationship that people have with these things. I mean, I agree with you, Texas Pelican, that there is, you know, the prestige of awards uh, is is on rockier ground than it used to be. Maybe because, you know, the generations who <laughs> were more invested in these awards because, well, they created them in the first place are kind of aging out and dying off. And, um, <laughs> well, I mean, I don't, I'd, I'd have to thank Texas Pelican, but I may have enjoyed one or two. Um, <laughs> But yeah, but I, I think with every award, also there is something of the the weird recency yeah. factor. I mean, I I, I make this joke yeah. a, a lot of the times, but like there are so many people in science fiction fandom, or who consider themselves science fiction fans, who maybe have not read a book that came out after 1979, um, but like who constantly be like, man, when I was a kid, like all the Hugo winners were these great all time classics, and every year now it's just some new stuff. <laughs> Yeah, and, yeah, and it, it is hard to say, like, oh, mm -hmm. like this book that came out this year, like this is going to be the classic that that yeah stems the 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 dot you know the length of time, and so therefore, sometimes I think people get the sense of like, well, this year's awards are nothing like it was you know mm -hmm. thirty years ago because those movies from thirty years ago are the all time classics or mm -hmm. you know, well, those yeah. movies are the old. Probably yeah. because they're thirty years old. Yeah, that's probably that's, because they're thirty years old. How linear time works, right? <laughs> yeah, um, you know, and... the building up of a of a reputation over years. I mean that that is how I think prestige is defined. You know, uh, that's right? Why, that's why it takes time. Um, but I think that's why yeah, you get right. some people saying like, "Oh, mm -hmm. the awards now aren't as special as the ones that had already existed when I was born." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, you're looking at generational bias. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I, you know, what I mean when I say that we have this love hate relationship is that I think on the one hand we just kind of like knowing that like these institutions are there, if only so yeah. that we have an excuse to complain about them, right? <laughs> like you know, the, probably you know, the, half the people who are complaining about again, you know, Greta Gerwig and and Margot Robbie being snubbed at the Oscars probably weren't going to watch the Oscars anyway because they already hate right. them, right? But they're happy to complain about them, right? Because it's yes. something to talk about. Uh, so you know, it could be that. Um, but I mean, certainly know. with with this one, you have some people who be like, "Oh, now the Hugo, the Hugos are irrelevant and dead." It's like mm -hmm. you say that every time there's a scandal with a mm -hmm. certain tone of like, "Hugos are dumb," and I never wanted one anyway. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think on the whole, I mean, if, if I think if you're like to back people up against the wall, you know, they they would don't probably mind awards so much, but they would just like them to maybe be less stupidly handled the way they True. seem to be all the time. They they would like to have. Whether it's political or personal or, you know, just, you know, tastemakers feeling like, you know, it's their responsibility to, you know, uh, you know be, be elitist and, and you know, correct the masses, what have you, whatever, whatever's going on, something people would like to have these things continue and be part of, you know, whatever sort of artistic community they're in, if they feel they're honestly reflective right. of the community they well, feel they belong to. And but the also the nature of every award is you're going to you're going to alienate some people because either like an award can be this massively popular voted thing and then oh they just selected the popular trash or it can be a juried award with only you know five people being decisions. like oh those are pretentious idiots who just picked the things that they liked and that has nothing to do with what people like there there's no way to win but yeah. you know at the same time you know. Yeah, at the end of the day, if it's a public, if it's a public award or a jury award, the people yeah. 
people are picking what they like and yeah. people, people do, you know, who probably, you know, I mean, it's, it's not invalid to complain that maybe the Hugos have become a popularity contest, but you know, when I was researching for, you know, my series with my reading the Hugos review series and found out like in the first, at least few years of the award, uh, certainly the year that uh, they'd rather be right of one for best novel. <laughs> You know, there were, it was like a handful of people, the entire convention attendance was a handful of people in a hotel ballroom, right? right. And the, the, the categories were read out from the podium and the winners were picked right then and there by a show of hands from the audience. <laughs> That's how they did it in like the early 1950s. So this had to kind of do, so, so we've to, moved on. Yeah, to, so we've some, moved on to a more, more equitable of, system. Of and on the whole, yeah. <laughs> but on the know, whole, we we need to stress that the system has been equitable and transparent uh, most of the time. Yeah. And this year is the first time. Like there's been scandals, but this is the first time this kind of scandal of random ineligibilities and wow these numbers look doctored it came up like even when we had the the whole sad puppy scandal which i'm not going to go into the full history of you can google it but like on some level the sad puppies proved the integrity of the nomination process yes that, yes these guys were tools. yeah these guys tried to game the you know, game the awards within the rules and got a bunch of stuff on the ballot but the people running the ballots didn't go, oh, these nominations look fishy. I'm just going to knock them off, which technically they right. could have. But like the rules don't really empower them that they should do that. No. And so thus this time, the fact that just a random decision was made or a decision based on Chinese politics or the presumption of Chinese politics, like we don't even know like what. Yeah, I mean, as we, we were talking about before we went live here, I mean, like multiple things can be true. There yes. could have been some political <laughs> pressure. There could have been some favoritism. There could have been, you know, incompetence. There could have been a whole lot of, a little bit of a whole lot of different things. A little bit of everything. Playing into all of this. But, um, I mean, Dave swears that he didn't get any, like, official communication. And I'm sure that, like, an official didn't call him into a room and say, look, we cannot have Rebecca Kwong be on the ballot. I'm sure nothing like that directly happened. But there might have been some, you know, soft pressure and he might have imagined soft pressure and made decisions based on that. But that's just random speculation and we can't really know what it is that, that you know. And I, I, I shouldn't and, and even... The man ain't talking. I shouldn't even... The man ain't talking. And I shouldn't even, like, try to ascribe motivations beyond that but um but yeah that's <laughs> that's how that is oh you're muted again so to a certain extent you know do we think that like juried awards or for example something like the nebula which is you know like they're just the writers group the specific members of a writers group you know who make that choice are those awards more meaningful i don't know i mean i personally find for example the jury awards like the Clarks, take, for, for instance, um, I usually find them more interesting to my own tastes simply because what they choose is stuff that I'm less likely to have heard of or it's a little more high profile, a bit more obscure. And so that, but by being nominated for the Clarks, that makes me really interested in them, you know, simply because it's like, oh, well, okay, here's something that I don't know about or I know less right. about, but because it has impressed, you know, this cool group of people, um, you know, because uh, I'll, I'll check it out now. Now, do I think that it means more? Again, th I, that's going to be a subjective choice individually. Yeah. I will say, though, that I, I think that juried awards feel less public pressure to conform to maybe popular tastes and are mm -hmm. personally to me more interesting because of that. But, you know, other people may not might not feel that way. Yeah, as far as comparing Nablus to Hugo's, I mean, I think I think it, certainly for a lot of authors, I think they're relatively on the same level of, of how people feel about them. But I, again, person to person, you're going to get a different opinion. Um, and, and, the, and the nebulous or not, we should point out uh, free of their own history of like, you know, sus activity. That's and true shenanigans, too. Shenanigans. Um, <laughs> so, and they've had to kind of deal with their own issues. So yeah, I'll tell you what, t uh, let's go ahead and wrap this one up. What do you think should, uh, you know, cause we've, I think we've got a little over an hour here. <laughs> so what, what would you ideally like to see? What do you think could happen 
to, um, again, not just fix these sort of organizational, institutional problems that led to this happening, but just in terms of letting folks like, you know, our wonderful, no, George, no shenanigans, um, you know, uh, you know, folks like you right here in our comments, my wonderful commenters, uh, is there transparency with who has, uh, well, yeah, I mean, we, uh, we, I mean, we all presumably the other eight people who are yeah. part of that committee, and yeah. beyond that, beyond that, I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, yeah, like, like there, which is the weird thing because we have that level of transparency that like the numbers went out, even though they're mm -hmm. they're bogus, and I mean, which is also kind of the funny thing here, mm -hmm. where once again, you know, yes, he's required by the Constitution to put them out after 90 days. But if they just didn't, like, again, there would have been some grumbling and grousing, but then yeah, this how, wouldn't how's there come any, out. There wouldn't be any... Like there, maybe there maybe yeah. someone brought a lawsuit? I don't know. Would have there been grounds for someone... Yeah, hard to say. Really, there would have been just, like, grousing and grumbling and, like... But, like, as is the nature of these things and the sort of, you know, old boy handshake network that so much of this stuff runs on, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think, you know, Maybe, maybe that's maybe that's a thing that uh, yeah, could decoupling again. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think could it help the best this? case scenario would be some form of decoupling. Yeah, and with that, then you can get greater degrees of enforceability about certain things. And mm -hmm. I think, I mean, I certainly think the big singular thing would be that that Dave probably should never should never it. be allowed within <laughs> hundred miles of the should whole never world. be allowed to. to, to to run well, the Hugo Awards again. Yeah, well, puts in the way that, I mean, he's showing, he's just showing his character in his Facebook, which yeah. is incredible, but, you know, it's like, yeah, it's not, it's not what you want to see. Um, you know, you, you do expect to see at least some kind of uh, professionalism and, and uh, or just, you know. And in theory, all the other people on the committee as well, but mm -hmm. yeah. whether or not that really happens or not, like, you know, uh, unfortunately, there's no enforceability mechanism to prevent whoever mm -hmm. is, say, the con of whatever the 2026 world con is, because I know he's not going to be the chair of, of the, uh, you know, of the Hugo subcommittee for, for Glasgow or for Seattle, but whatever we'll it is in 2026. That, yeah. yeah. If I, yeah but like if, if, whoever is for 2026 is like, Oh, but Dave's Dave's my friend. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be mean to Dave. And unfortunately that is part of the problem with the system. Yeah. Is that's, that is a lot of how, it works. Yeah, the, the, and, the old boy network protecting their own yeah. campaign is what kind of needs to be just you know jettisoned. Um, yeah. I know that I think the uh, the administrator for 2026 for Seattle is a uh, Nicholas White. Yes, uh, whom I you know is a, and is I, I've always considered him you know man of good character. So I, I I found him to be the same, and like every uh -huh. time he's run the Hugos, when this information comes out, he is. You know, he is very transparent about like here's the other details, like the and um like for example, about 10 years ago, I think it was at I think it was at San Antonio. <clears throat> and I don't know if this was Nicholas who was running this or not, but there's an example where in short story, I'm pretty sure it was short story, it might have been novel, but either way, um Mary Robinette Cole's um Lady Astronaut of Mars had enough nominations to be nominated. But it had come out as an audible, as an audio story rather than written work. And somebody decided, made the ruling that, well, this was an audible story and the the script for it has like, uh, you know, has actor directions. So therefore it is not a short story. It is, it would be dramatic, under, like yeah. dramatic presentation. And so therefore it's not eligible. And I, I, I declared it ineligible, mm -hmm. which was probably a bad call, but the, call and the logic was transparent there mm -hmm. and <laughs> even if most people were like that that's terrible but at least yeah. you could see what the decision was and yeah. i mean and so i think you need that sort of that decoupling so it isn't just this random like whoever the chair picks to be their friend who runs it this year mm -hmm. and that you know it is a central organization that you know treats it like treats it like accounting work rather than mm -hmm. you know <laughs> rather than fandom work. I yeah. Mean, that's yeah. that's really what it's gotta come down to.
Yeah, it, it just it it needs to be you know people going into this if if there is this expectation and 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 it, and it's like expectation everyone has a right to have because that really has kind of been the the, the character of the awards for all these decades is that you know if the Hugos represent the opinions and tastes and the voice of shall we say fandom you know in as much as you know I, obviously it's going to be just the fandom who vote. <laughs> If it is supposed to be representative of all of us, then it should be accountable to all of us. Yeah. And, you know, and we can't have these, you know, smoff guys just off doing smoff stuff in their little smoke filled rooms and being all secretive. And, and say, yeah. oh, you can't change the rules because we made the rule that you can't change the rule. No, <laughs> no, just not going to fly. But, um, so, but anyway, um, all right, so I know I, I'm sure we could go on for another hour about this, but I think we kind of covered the rest of it. So yeah. I guess final thoughts, Marshall, in terms of, you know, again, so, you know, we, we, we consider, you know, we like going to world cons. We think the Hugos have value. If we want to just, again, talk to, you know, like people like my viewers, uh, you know, uh, millennial and Gen Z readers and people coming up in their science fiction fandom, you know, you know, how, how do we, you know, how do we uh, want to say, you know, hey, this can count for you uh, if, you know, if you want it to. And what can we do to make that, you know, to, to communicate that effectively and, you know, sort of change hearts and minds, as it were? I mean, that that is a tough call because I or think should we even? I mean, maybe we should. No, we? I think I think we should. But I like I also don't want to tell people like, oh, you got to you got to go and go to the business meeting and spend, oh, you know, two thousand dollars for the weekend and, and sit and <laughs> put yourself through that because yeah. that's excruciating and expensive um mm -hmm. but um i mean at the same time like if you want to participate in something then then choose to participate mm -hmm. and and push yourself in, if that's the thing you might enjoy and if you want and also build something because you think it's worth build something new so yeah. that can become something new and prestigious yeah. um and there's no, I mean, I say there's nothing stopping you, but like all this began because a bunch of guys got together in 1939 in New York and declared it the World Science Fiction Convention. So mm -hmm. there's no reason why you in 2025 can't do, can't launch your own thing and be the first annual of that. Right, exactly. If if, if you have the time and energy and space yeah. to do that, of course. <laughs> but but and, and yeah. And I'm proud to say that there are people like you know, in my little community who have done that. Uh, a couple of my dear friends, you know, Samantha and Marines, you know, for, in the BookTube community, started their little conference, BookNet Fest, in 2017, and it's gone for a couple of years. Broke for um, it, it broke for COVID, obviously, <laughs> um, but it's a sort of a little conference for creators to sort of meet one another. Uh, now all they need to do, I think, is kind of get the hell out of Florida. <laughs> I think <they're> <laughs> I think there's consideration but about. Uh, I heard good things about it this this past year. So yeah, uh, and so it's a, but, but there's a talk about possibly shifting it to Chicago because I think uh, you know uh, uh, Sam is closer to that area. So there's yeah, uh, Marinus is wonderful. So so there is some of that going on. Our little group here, just online on YouTube, we had for a little while we had our BookTube SFF Awards, which really was just an excuse for us to dress up in front of a live stream and and talk about the books we liked and and also sure. let our viewers. <laughs> vote for things, you know, it's, but it's exactly the same spirit that you, as you said, created Worldcon, created the Hugos. And, you know, and, and, and if you guys go and watch my uh, video on, uh, I mean, the Ignite Awards from just, just starting Ign a few Ignite years Awards. ago. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> you know, to, again, which basically started because Hugo <laughs> shenanigans in 2020 and then yeah. they went like, yeah. they went like, fuck this. Let's make our own. Yeah, and exactly. They've exactly. Been, and, make our and, own, make our own con and make our own awards, and they did, and they've already yeah. gotten a lot of. And it's a gorgeous award, isn't it? Those medallions they give out, you know. It's I wonderful. think it's, I I haven't yeah. seen one in person, but yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I haven't yeah. seen it in person, but I mean, there's there's photos you can you know. Yeah, there's, there's a gorgeous one. So yes, like, folks do this, and so folks I, do this, and and usually in the wake of like, all right, well, these guys screwed it up, so let's do it better. And but at a certain point, and I think this is true for the ignites and and many of the other awards that have come along, especially you know, it's like now I think they deserve to stand on their own. You know, they shouldn't. They get to, they deserve to be looked at as their own successes. And not yeah. just set against, well, you know, here's you know, all the old white guys screwed up. So here's, you know. I mean, uh, even even the Dragon Awards kind of started with the puppies going like, yeah. well, fine, we'll make our own awards. And they which, did. I kinda, which I kind of wonder why, um, 
you know, it, they could have just done that in the first place because now the Dragon Awards, I think, are slowly kind of starting to build a good rep and and they have good categories and, and you know, some and and it's not just the same. I mean, in certain categories it is, but it's not just their usual gang of suspects who get nominated. Well, it started that way, but then once it actually became more noticed and popular, mm-hmm. it kind of mirrored, it's, it's often a lot of the same stuff that, that gets. Well, true, but yeah, but yeah. And, and you can say that for still a lot of the mainstream awards too. Though, so yeah. Was, uh, but yeah, um, it's uh, so yeah, you know, just participate in fandom in the way that I think is meaningful to you. And that I think kind of yeah. suits your desires, a bunch of, yeah, this is, um, where we go. Okay. Just, I guess folks are again, you know, giving little shout outs for things that are going on on very on here and other platforms and what have you. Um, so, uh, yeah. All right. Well, uh, Marshall, I want to thank you so much again for your time this afternoon. Like I said, I know there's impromptu. I like, I posted <laughs> you late last night and, and, you know, with about this. You free uh, tomorrow afternoon? Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but that tends to be how things go in this uh, wide online world of ours. So I want to thank all of you for joining as, as always. Um, there's again, some, some relevant links uh, in the, the uh, below section, and I will add a couple more uh, once the this the archived version of this video is up. Please go, and, and I'll, there's also links to Marshall's presence online, including his now his uh, his own imprint and his stuff. So go and check him out. Go and check out his podcast and everything, because he's a wonderful writer too, very fun books. And uh, otherwise, I guess, I don't know, man, I'll, I'll see you when I see you. If not in Glasgow, uh, certainly at ArmadilloCon. And uh, you know, perhaps before, if I get to figure out when it's going to be this year, I need to, I need to bug. Yeah, I mean, (laughs) you can get lined up for it, ready to do my next uh, state law on stage interview. Those are always a blast. So uh, yeah, and I hope to do more uh, chats uh, soon as well with some folks. Um, But uh, all right, so thank you all for joining me. Thank you, Marshall, and and uh, we will see you all again uh, very soon. I will be back uh, uh, tomorrow night for my reading hangout for those of you who join me live for that every Thursday. So all right then, so long and thank you. <laughs>